Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Great. Um, thank you so much to the ASN um, Award Committee for this award. I'm really honored to be here. Excited to talk to you all today. Excited to talk to you all today about um, symbiosis. Microbes are really fascinating to me um, because of their profound impact on the ecology and evolution of um, life and um, how it's contributed to the diversity of associations that we see here. My research is um, broadly on the evolution of symbiosis, so looking at how different biotic and abiotic factors can shape the evolution of host microbe associations going forward. And on the other side of the same coin, looking at how being in symbiosis can impact the evolution of the symbiont, the host, and any other players involved. I'm going to talk to you um, today about three short stories on how we address these questions. First, looking at how an incipient symbiont can affect the evolution or the can impact the um, adaptation of their host. And I did this work for my PhD with Nicole Gerardo and Levi Moran at Emory University. So one of the things that's really um, fascinating to me about symbioses is that some of these associations are very old. The host and the symbionts in these associations have been together for millions of years. Um, and after such a long time, the host and the symbiont can become so dependent on one another that the symbiont becomes integrated into um, like the host. So at, that after a billion years, the symbiont can become something like the, um, an organelle, like the mitochondrion and chloroplast, which are hypothesized to have evolved from symbiotic interactions. What my research is focused on is at the other end of this timeline where the host and the symbiont are independent of one another. So at some point in time, um, the, all of the host and the symbionts we see here were not in symbiosis. So what were the forces that brought them together to form the associations that um, we see here today? And despite their ubiquity and importance, um, so there's not a lot known about how um, symbioses originated. From extant symbioses, we know that um, associating with symbionts can confer hosts with lots of different benefits, like through nutrient provisioning um, and also defense against abiotic and biotic um, factors. And so a, um, a new association between a host and a microbe might form when that microbe helps to facilitate host adaptation to a stressful environment. Um, because when, by associating with the, the microbe, the host can gain additional traits that would allow them to occupy um, niches that they would not be able to um, occupy by themselves. And so we might expect that when the host encounters a stressful environment and interacts with a protective microbe that protects it in that environment, host fitness will increase. And this will select for continual association with the protective microbe across host generations in that particular environment. And so to address the question of whether an association with a novel protective microbe can facilitate host adaptation, we did, uh, we passaged a nematode host with a bacterium for several generations. The host that we used is the nematode C. elegans. In addition to having really short generation time and a lot of offspring, they can also be cryopreserved, meaning that we can directly compare ancestral and evolved populations. They also have this natural interaction with bacteria where they feed on bacteria, but the bacteria can also colonize um, their gut. So they're sort of an emerging model for looking at gut, host, gut microbe host interactions. The idea that a symbiont can be a food or can be acquired through ingestion is not uncommon in nature. For example, leafcutter ants form um, fungal cultivars as, um, solely as a food source. A lot of shoe bugs ingest their bacterial symbionts, um, but they don't digest them, um, but instead allow them to proliferate within their gut. And then some symbionts can act as both a food um, 
in addition to serving other functions, uh, in addition to serving other functions like the, cyanur, uh, the Xenoraptor's bacteria that helps Cyanurema nematodes infect insects. So just because the, the worms um, eat bacteria, it doesn't necessarily prevent them from directly um, sort of interacting with the bacteria that can colonize their gut. And so in the lab, we uh, rear the worms on E. coli. So most other bacteria that we introduce to them um, would be sort of bacteria that they would not have had any evolutionary history um, with. And so the, uh, the microbe that we're using um, in this experiment is the bacterium bacillus subtilis. And we used it because it has a protective effect. The worms are um, normally reared at 15 to 25 degrees Celsius. We found that when they were reared on B. subtilis, they produced more offspring compared to when they were on E. coli, when they were heat shocked at 34 degrees. So we see that the ancestral state of this interaction is beneficial um, for our hosts in terms of reproduction under heat stress. So we can use a system to address whether B. subtilis can affect nematodes, nematode adaptation to heat. So we did experimental evolution um, with several different treatments. The first treatment we had um, was when the host was passaged in the presence of the um, protective microbe, B. subtilis, in the presence of heat shock. Um, we had five replicate populations where we reared the worms on B. subtilis and then heat shock them, and then took, them, um, took the offspring of these heat shocked worms, reared them up on the um, stock B. subtilis, so the ancestral B. subtilis, and then heat shock them again. We did this passaging for 20 generations. We had another treatment where we passaged them in the presence of the protective microbe, but in the absence of heat shock. We had two additional treatments where we evolved the worms in the absence of the protective microbe, so just with E. coli under heat shock, and then in the absence of both the protective microbe and the heat shock. So in the end, we had four um, treatments with uh, five replicate populations each of evolved hosts. And then to test whether there were any um, changes that have evolved between these different treatments, we took these worms and we grew them up on the ancestral B. subtilis and then heat shock them, and then measured um, host fitness in terms of fecundity, as well as microbial fitness in terms of the number of colony forming units. Here, um, this is the uh, data for fecundity. The dotted line is the ancestral mean, so the mean fecundity for the ancestral host paired with the ancestral um, B. subtilis. So here we see that when worms evolved in the presence of um, heat stress with B. subtilis, they produce more offspring compared to um, in the absence of heat stress um, and in the presence of heat stress, but in the absence of the protective microbe, and then in the absence of both um, heat stress and the protective microbe at generation 20. So this is evidence that evolving with protective microbe under stress facilitated host adaptation to that stress. And so next we asked whether does adaptation affect microbial fitness. So we took the evolved host and um, reared them up on the, uh, ancestr the ancestral B. subtilis and then quantified the, um, the abundance of bacteria within each worm. And we saw that hosts that evolved with heat stress um, with the protective microbe actually had the highest abundance of the bacteria. So here we also see an increase in um, bacterial fitness. And what's really neat about this result is that in this experiment, only the host was evolving. So the increase in bacterial fitness um, is actually due to changes in the host alone. And so here, to address whether associating with a novel protective microbe can facilitate host adaptation, we saw that hosts can benefit the most when they evolved in the presence of both the protective microbe and um, under stress. We also saw an increase in microbial fitness um, even when the host is evolving, when only the host is evolving. So 
um, given time, our protective gut occupant has the potential to become a more traditional symbiont. So for this first question, um, we saw that when uh, their positive outcomes can result for both the host and the microbe, even when the host is evolving. We then asked what would happen if both the host and the microbe were to evolve, so when they're allowed to co-evolve with one another. And co-evolution has the potential to promote um, increased benefits because they can, it, it can lead to hosts and symbionts that are more locally adapted to one another, so that if hosts were um, to be paired with symbionts that they did not co-evolve with, um, fitness tends to decrease. And the role of co-evolution has been um, tested in a lot of different systems in nature, as well as in the lab, where co-evolution has been shown to increase benefits for both partners, um, as well as decreasing um, antagonism between hosts and parasites. So here we're asking whether co-evolution can promote the evolution of new associations between hosts and microbes. And we would predict that it would facilitate host adaptation even more. Um, here we're comparing two different experimental evolution treatments. The first treatment uh, we'll call the singly passaged host. This is the same treatment as in the previous section where the host evolved in the presence of both the protective microbe and the heat stress. And then we also had another uh, treatment where we co-passaged the host and the um, B. subtilis. So in addition to um, passaging on the offspring of the heat shocked host, we also took the heat shocked host and extracted bacteria out from them and then used that to seed the next generation. So in the end, we have host populations as well um, as co-passaged bacterial populations. To compare between them, we took these hosts and we paired them with the ancestral B. subtilis. We also paired them against um, pair them up with the co-evolved bacteria and measured host fitness in terms of fecundity. And so in terms of the co-passaged host being paired with co-passaged bacteria, what we did was we simply paired them up with the bacteria that they were um, evolving with during the experiment. So essentially, they're sympatric bacteria. Here we're looking at um, the fecundity for hosts or co-passage host paired with their co-passage bacteria versus singly passage host paired with the ancestral bacteria. And we see that actually there was not a difference in terms of host fitness. So our prediction um, is not supported here. And so we wondered whether this um, lack of difference might be due to the bacteria evolving to be um, harmful in general. But when we looked at um, when we paired these bacteria with the singly passage hose, there were also no difference in terms of fitness um, compared to when these hosts were paired with the ancestral bacteria. We then wondered whether it was because the cold passage hose had become unhealthy in some way um, throughout the experiment. But actually, these hosts did better um, when they were paired with the ancestral bacteria compared to when they were paired with their own cold passage bacteria. So these results indicate that the co-passage hosts have the potential to adapt, but they may be impeded by their bacteria. We then asked whether this reduction in fitness was due to um, some sort of specific host microbe interactions, or whether it was due to a more general um, co-passaging passaging process. So what we did was a test for local adaptation, where we had sympatric pairings, where hosts were paired with their um, co-passage bacteria. We also had allopatric pairings, where we took the same host and paired them up with the other bacteria that they were not co-passaged with. And it did the same for the bacteria in all possible combinations. So we ended up with five sympatric combinations and 20 allopatric combinations, and then measured their fecundity, and then also bacterial fitness in terms of the CFUs. So here, this is the host fitness um, data with the um, with x-axis divided by bacteria populations. So for the first population, we saw that when hosts were paired with the sympatric bacteria, they produced fewer offspring compared to when the bacteria was paired with um, the other allopatric hosts. 
we see a similar pattern across all the um, populations where the sympatric pairing produced fewer offspring or the second fewer number of offspring compared to the allopatric pairings. So overall, cold passage bacteria seem to be providing the least fitness benefits towards their sympatric host. We don't see this pattern in terms of bacterial fitness. Um, there was no um, significant difference, so it seems like the bacteria are growing as well in sympatric host as, um, as in allopatric host. And so with this result, and um, with what we saw with the last assay, um, it might suggest that coevolution between hosts and microbes in the nascent association may actually prevent hosts from reaching their adaptive potential. So contrary to what we predicted, partner switching um, actually increased host fitness in our experiment. So coevolution may actually not play as um, important of a role in the evolution of novel associations. For my PhD work, I looked at different forces that can shape the establishment of new associations between hosts and microbes, and saw that associating with a protective microbe can facilitate host adaptation, but also hinder it. For my postdoc, I am looking at how being in symbiosis can impact the evolution of an interaction species, um, specifically that of a pathogen. And I'm doing this work with Kayla King at Oxford and Tim Reed at Emory. So all the symbi symbionts we see here can be um, sort of loosely classified as having a nutritional or protective role, um, either from abiotic factors, like the these subtleists from my PhD, or they can also defend hosts against enemies. There are a few ways that um, defensive symbionts can protect the host. One way is by directly interfering with the pathogen um, that infect hosts um, through production of toxins or antimicrobials. They could also defend hosts by taking up resources or space that the pathogen needs in order to um, grow. And the symbiont can also indirectly interact with the pathogen by upregulating um, and priming host immunity. For example, by upregulating certain immune genes in the host to prime them, um, to prepare them for a subsequent pathogen infection. And there's not a lot known about how immune priming by symbionts can affect um, pathogen evolution. There's not a lot of theoretical or empirical work on this, but we can sort of borrow a little bit from the pathogen literature to make our predictions. Like symbionts, prior exposure to a pathogen can also prime hosts for um, a second exposure to either uh, the same pathogen or even a different pathogen, um, which allows them to survive better when they're infected or exposed to um, the pathogen the second time. What can also happen is when hosts are exposed to a more virulent pathogen, this can elicit an even stronger immune response, so they're even more protected. But, um, but incomplete immunity can also happen where hosts are protected um, or that are able to survive the pathogen during the second exposure, but the pathogen can still successfully infect the host. And this has actually been predicted to select for increased pathogen virulence due to a couple of reasons. The first one is because the pathogen no longer pays the cost of virulence. So in a situation without immune priming, hosts are, uh, if the pathogen is too virulent, it ends up killing the host before it's transmitted. But with the uh, protection from prior immune priming, this, um, this would lead to the host not dying, and so the pathogen no longer has to pay this cost of virulence. And then the second reason is that with the strong immune priming, um, conferred by the higher virulent strains, this might actually prevent infection by um, less virulent strains. And so, since immune priming by pathogens um, my, is predicted to select for increased pathogen virulence, we might predict the same to happen with immune priming from symbionts. Because even though symbionts can protect hosts from pathogen infection in some cases, um, the pathogen can still successfully um, colonize the host and allow for transmission. 
and then hosts are primed um, by symbionts or more protected um, and can elicit a strong immune response compared to hosts that don't have a symbiont. So this could also inhibit less virulent pathogens. And so to um, address this, to test these uh, predictions, we again use experimental evolution. Um, we use the elegans as the host for the pathogen. We use the um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And for the symbiont, um, we use Pseudomonas mendocina. And uh, even though Pseudomonas aeruginosa is sort of an opportunistic pathogen, Pseudomonas mendocina has actually been found to be a part of the core microbiome of C. elegans in nature. And it was found previously that mendocina protects against aeruginosa um, in the worms. And so on the left graph, we see that when the worms are exposed to mendocina, they're able to better survive um, original cell infection compared to E. coli. And this is through immune priming because when the authors repeated this experiment with an immunocompromised host, we don't see the same level of protection as in the wild type host. And so we replicated this result in the lab. And again, in the presence of the symbiont in the wild type host, we saw higher host survival compared to in its absence. And then we don't see a difference between the presence and absence of the symbiont in the immunocompromised host. We also looked at pathogen load um, in the wild type host, and again saw a reduction in terms of pathogen load in the presence of the symbiont. However, we can see that from the plot as well as in, um, in the worms themselves, that the pathogen can still able to colonize worms even after exposure to the symbiont. So we use the system to ask whether immune priming by the symbiont can affect pathogen evolution. And from the theory that we saw earlier, we can make some predictions for the evolution of pathogen virulence in the system. So in a wild type host where um, there is a fully functioning um, immune system, and in the presence of the immune priming symbiont, we might expect the evolution of the highest level of virulence. In the absence of the symbiont, we would expect um, evolution of mild virulence in the wild type host. And then in immunocompromised hosts, in the absence, or sorry, in the presence of the symbiont, we might expect there to be partial um, amount of defense, since there might be other components of the immune system that are still functioning, um, and or the symbiont might be interacting with the pathogen in some way. And then in the absence of any defense, then we would expect there to be the lowest level of virulence. So for experimental evolution, we had different treatments here. Um, we're passaging the pathogen in the presence of uh, through hosts, through wild type hosts that had been primed by the symbiont. We had another treatment where we had, um, we passaged the pathogen through wild type hosts that um, were reared in the absence of the symbiont, so they were not primed. And then we also had immunocompromised hosts that were um, reared with the symbiont, and also immunocompromised hosts that were reared without the symbiont. We also passage, we had another treatment where we passage the pathogen in the absence of any host. And then in the end, to measure virulence after 14 passages, we um, took all of these evolved pathogen populations and we used them to infect wild type hosts um, in the absence of the symbiont. We measured host mortality in order to quantify virulence and then pathogen load as well. Here again, the dotted line is the value host mortality for the, um, the host when they were infected with the ancestral pathogen. And then the dashed line is um, when the hosts were infected with the, um, the pathogen that would passage in the absence of the host. And so we see here that the highest level of host mortality was caused by pathogens that have been passaged in the presence of the symbiont in wild type hosts. The next two were next to highest level mortalities where um, pathogens passage in the presence of the symbiont in wild type hosts and um, in immunocompromised hosts in the presence of the symbiont. And then the lowest um, host mortality was caused by the pathogens that were passaged in the absence of the symbiont through immunocompromised hosts, which means that all the predictions were met. Most importantly, that host with um, with the 
the highest level of defense um, led to the highest um, increase in virulence. And then when we look at pathogen load, we saw sort of a different pattern where the treatments with the highest virulence and the lowest virulence had the same number of um, pathogen density, which suggests that the evolved virulence that we see may not depend on pathogen load. And then we're sort of starting um, to get into the genomic um, underpinnings of these interactions. And so we took the evolved populations of passage 14 um, and sequenced them and then compared the genomes to the ancestral clone. So any of the mutations we detect would be de novo mutations that arose throughout the experimental um, evolution experiment. So this is a um, phylogeny of the um, most virulent treatment and um, of the least virulent treatment. Um, so they're in green and pink, respectively. And when we look at the genetic distance from the ancestor, we saw that the, um, the Y type plus symbiont uh, treatment had, was not um, as distant from the ancestor compared to the immunocompromised without symbiont treatment. Um, suggesting that host defenses, um, really strong host defenses, might actually limit pathogen molecular evolution. Um, and this was interesting because previous studies have found that um, in absence of host defense, can actually select for pathogen genetic diversity. And these studies also found that um, hosts that are immunocompromised can select for um, attenuated virulence, which is exactly what we found in our study. So in summary, um, we saw that virulence was the greatest when the pathogen was passed through the protective host, the most protective host, and that this high level of protection may actually limit pathogen genome evolution, whereas a lack of defenses can increase pathogen diversity while reducing virulence. And so we see here that um, associating with a symbiont can have negative effects on hosts. There are actually a lot of examples of context dependency in symbiosis on an ecological time scale. And from what we saw with this um, section, as well as in the previous one with co-evolution, associating with symbionts um, can also have detrimental effects on hosts on sort of an evolutionary time scale. And this was a theme that we had not set out to um, Study, I guess, when we started these projects, but it sort of highlights the sort of nuances and complexities that um, can uh, that microbes can bring to the evolution of life. With that I'd like to thank everyone here, um, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>